Hey, welcome back to Dead Game News. I actually thought I might be retiring this series after my Games as a Service is Fraud video, because honestly, that's what this was all leading up to. I don't like reporting this news, so I'm trying to make Dead Games a dead thing instead. Now that video is going to get a follow-up, probably multiple ones, but this news is so big and complicated that I felt like it just couldn't wait. So here we are. I only have one news story this time, but it is a bombshell. Enough to bring me back up here doing this. So here it is. The High Court of Paris has ruled on a lawsuit against Valve brought against them by a French consumer group for anti-consumer rights activities. It took them four years, but they totally ruled against Valve. Valve said they weren't guilty because Steam is a subscription service and thus not liable. The court said no, Steam sells games in perpetuity and not as part of a subscription package. That means they are goods and subject to European Union laws regarding goods, specifically ones regarding resale, which Valve's terms of service does not allow. So long story short, the French court is requiring Valve to enable Steam users to resell their games. In other words, create a digital used games market. Valve disagrees with this decision and is appealing it. Now there are more details to this case, but those are the parts I'm concerned with, and this whole thing absolutely ties back to dead games. Now don't worry, most of this video is not going to be about law specifics. It's going to be about what are the real world consequences of this. We get to predict the future, guys. Okay, there is no way I'm going to be able to talk about this and not leave a lot of people confused. So here's the simple version. This court case is a serious mixed bag. It has the potential to change the games industry forever. And in my opinion, not in a positive way. But there is a major silver lining here that could actually lead to a lot less games being destroyed. Oh, and hey, this won't be the last time you hear me say this, but I'm sorry, I have to point this out. This court ruling totally vindicates what I was saying in the games as a service is fraud video. I put so much time into researching that, freaking nobody was talking about this except that Delissa you guy. American copyright lawyers started coming out of the woodwork trying to tear it down, and hey, I'm operating completely powerless here. I felt naked in the breeze making that. But what did I say? The difference between a good and a service freaking matters. That can have real consequences under the law, and this is a giant gray zone. Now what the French court ruling was aiming for is different than what I was, but their legal reasoning is almost identical to what I was saying. In other words, I mostly got that right. If I was wrong about what I said in that video, then this court decision could not exist. But it does exist, so boom, vindicated. Even if the ruling gets overturned later, it could not have made it this far without having substance. Okay, so back to the actual news. Where to start with this monster? I guess the first thing is that if this gets appealed and overturned, then none of this matters. I have no clue if that will happen or not. Again, this is all a giant gray zone. The law still doesn't know what to do. In Germany, there was a court case just like this, and they said, no, everything's fine. You don't need to resell your games. So almost identical situations, one court has one outcome, another court has the exact opposite. Do you own your games or not? I don't know, let's flip a coin. Welcome to the law. Anyway, if this stands, this could be so enormous. The first thing you should understand is this is not just a French thing. I saw some comments of people saying Valve should just stop selling in France. That'll show them. No, 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 that is not how this works, guys. It is so much bigger than that. This court case could easily lead to global changes. If the decision holds, then other countries in the EU could use this as a precedent. The next thing you know, it's standard EU practice. And once there is a European digital use games market, the industry could try, but it might be difficult to keep a lid on that globally. They probably would try because this is a clear and present danger to profits for the game industry. So it's going to be met with maximum resistance. Unless someone is a major insider going to cocktail parties with head officials at the EU, I'd say no one really knows how this is going to turn out. There's just too many variables in play to predict how big this will get. 
And this is not just Steam. Valve is always in court because they're a big, easy target, but it's not like it's only Valve selling digital copies of games. This affects stores like Origin, the Epic Store, the Xbox and PlayStation stores, GOG, Battle.net, or hmm, maybe a French company selling games under a French digital store. Maybe. Now, it may not, because as of this moment, this lawsuit is only directed at Valve. And so far, this is a fine Valve can afford to blatantly ignore, but I honestly have no idea if that could escalate. That's a question many heads of industry ask themselves every day. How profitable is it to ignore the law versus complying with it? I don't know the answer to that one. That's not really the domain of us mere mortals. But yeah, it's possible this consumer group only targets Valve and leaves every other digital game store alone for some reason, and nothing goes any further than this. But I wouldn't want to bet on that, because now the legal defenses are down. It all depends on how much pressure consumer groups want to apply against the industry. If this was a castle siege, this would mean the drawbridge is down and the front gate has been smashed open but the invading army hasn't moved in yet. Or rather, they've only attacked some guy named Gabe and everyone else is just standing there. So if the army decides to go in and invade the rest of the castle, then this changes everything in the games industry. It means a used digital games market will be a thing for any non-subscription game, which is the vast majority of them. Now the games industry has hated the used game market for decades because they received none of that money. A game sold by the publisher on sale for a dollar is worth more to them than one sold for $50 used. Now, in my opinion, big budget AAA games can weather this change just fine because they traditionally get the majority of their sales within the first two weeks anyway and a bunch from pre-orders. So I don't think this will actually change much on that front. I mean, they can use this as an excuse to change things, but they can totally survive this if they're not stupid. But for smaller studios and indie games, this could be brutal. I think if this change goes through all the way, this will really hurt the indie market and we're simply going to see a lot less games. That's why I said I see this change overall being a negative thing. Now here's where things may get a little divisive. I think these are both valid views, but I definitely lean towards one side over the other. The first side is going to be 100% behind this because they want to own their games, full stop. And that means they want to be able to sell their games when they're done with them, which is totally normal and traditional with physical goods. So by God, digital shouldn't change anything. Now myself, and I suspect most gamers, actually lean towards the other side, where I'm cool with not being able to resell my game in exchange for a lot of other benefits. So what are the benefits? Well, here are the ones I can think of. More money goes to the developer, and this almost certainly means more games because more money goes to the developer. And finally, lower prices. If a digital game can't be resold, then again, that means more money for the developer. So they don't have to charge higher prices to account for used games. Now this will of course vary from game to game, but man, if you wait for sales, I kind of feel like the industry has delivered on that promise. By the way, I'm not endorsing this game. I haven't even played it, but damn, the price is right. So coming from the perspective of a cheap ass PC gamer, I can say without hesitation, you get so much more bang for your buck now not being able to resell games compared to the old days where you could. So who does reselling benefit? Well, I can think of two obvious groups, middlemen and flippers. Now for flippers, these are mostly on consoles nowadays, but there are people who buy a game for 60 bucks, play it as fast as they can, then sell it while it's hot for 55, bam, they got to play for cheap. Or maybe they buy a collector's edition and sit on it for years, then resell it at a profit later. But even those people are probably interested in physical copies with aesthetic value that had a limited production due to real world restraints. That's not really a thing for digital copies since they can be copied an infinite number of times. And this is really all just an artificially imposed limitation. But it does exist. I saw comments pointing out how the most valuable games under this system would be delisted games that you literally cannot buy anymore. 
Yeah, those will bring in some money. As for the middlemen, these are people getting in the way of just buying a game directly to take a cut for themselves. In this case, it would be at the cost of the developers. Personally, I see this as kind of parasitic and would rather the money go to the people who made the game, but everybody needs a way to support themselves, so there's an argument that any job is a good thing, but I think this problem in general is just going to become a bigger and bigger issue as time goes on, and this is way bigger than just the games industry. You can check out my robot jobs video for more on that if you want. And hey, if we're going to be technical, this isn't really about a loss of ownership. On the contrary, it's about mandatory ownership. If you buy a copy of a game on a place like GOG, you own the game in every way except being able to sell it. It's yours for life. This law is about the option to lose your ownership in exchange for money, also known as selling. So I'm seeing this barely helping at all. Developers get less money, people buying and holding games probably wanted the physical copies anyway, this doesn't benefit people like me who actually want to keep their games, and the people who want to play games for cheap and not keep them, well, that's exactly the sort of person a rental service is for. It might be the better deal for them anyway. So other factors notwithstanding, which I'll get to in a second, I see much more of a net positive coming from not having a law like this. And I personally would rather not see things play out this way. Now, I have heard that Valve could implement this change, but then charge additional fees for resale to make used games not worth it. But I have to wonder if they wouldn't run up against antitrust laws if they were to do something like that due to their size. So maybe there's a way out of this that doesn't wreck small developers, but I'm not assuming that. This whole thing is a mess, and it almost feels like we're playing a kid's game with made-up rules as we go to make everything work. Capitalism gets weird once you have an infinite supply of something. Now, I'm hesitant to call this a backwards measure, because that is totally not the full story. But this reminds me of a Penny Arcade comic I saw before, where we're forcing an old standard that just isn't a good fit anymore. But of course, that is not the full story, because as many of you know, the games industry has been waging a war on ownership altogether. This is a dead game news episode. Forget not being able to resell your copy of a game. My whole beef is too often now, you can't even keep your copy of a game. Companies are still shutting down and bricking games you bought with no recourse for the consumer or just history in general. So don't let anyone tell you that this law is only an outdated measure that makes no sense at all. That leaves out too much of what's been happening. I see this more as a self-defense action for the consumer, even though I think they went about it the wrong way. But how does this law tie into dead games? Well, here's the silver lining. This law nails the concept of game ownership to the wall, except for subscription games. Again, it's pretty much exactly what I was saying in my Games as a Service video. I'm still not seeing any legal opening for subscription games, but for everything else? Oh yeah, there are protections and this case proves it. Now this French ruling does not save games in and of itself, but it is so close to creating protections against companies bricking your non-subscription games, which is the vast majority of them. This case did all the hard work. If this stands as precedent, it is so much easier to get French laws on planned obsolescence and mandatory repair instructions for games that companies shut down enforced. If we can get those enforced too, and it becomes precedent in the European Union, then that's it. Game over. Any game with a perpetual license is protected, and companies destroying games will be vastly reduced. Now that's not within our grasp yet, and it may still not happen, but I can actually see not destroying games on the horizon now. But let's talk about some other possible outcomes. One comment I saw a lot of was that no, this will lead to more games as a service. My answer to that is yes and no, and unless you're an expert on French law, I don't think you can say conclusively one way or the other. Plus, even then, there are two layers to this. See, I told you I was going to confuse people. Okay, the easy layer is subscription games you're paying for every month. So any game sold on Stadia, 
World of Warcraft subscribers. These games the law does nothing to protect. And yes, we'll probably encourage more of those services. But guess what? Game companies were doing this anyway. The industry does not want you to own copies of your game. They are obsessed with this idea. Now, like I said in the video, the MMO wars of the past proved there's only so much money to go around for subscription games. So that might be saturated already. As for streaming games, thankfully, uh, sort of, the internet situation in the USA especially still has issues and those games demand a lot of bandwidth. So hopefully the subpar experience of streaming douses some water on this fire and keeps games out of the cloud for longer. So yes, this law incentivizes subscription fees, but the market can only handle so many of those as it is. So it could be it has barely any impact on subscription games at all. Now the other layer is the majority of games as a service, where you buy the game or buy items in it, but you pay no subscription fee. Let me repeat that. Games as a service where you pay no subscription fee. Why did Valve get busted? Because the court said they're not a subscription service. So, like I mentioned in my fraud video, these companies are trying to have it both ways. They're selling the games as goods, yet running them as services and taking the responsibility of neither. I saw comments saying this will lead to more games like Anthem or Destiny where you buy the games but still have to connect online to play them and they can be cut off at any time. Well, I suspect this French court would not look kindly on games you buy as a good then the company shuts them down rendering your goods worthless. And for everybody saying you're buying the client, not the game, I don't think the court would like that reasoning either seeing as how the client has essentially no value without being a functional game also. I'm bringing this up because I saw comments like that too, even though I covered that in my fraud video. Damn, I did a good job on that for not being a lawyer. So while making more non-subscription games as a service might look like the answer to these companies, if they're still selling them as goods, then French laws against planned obsolescence could apply to them also and get them into even more trouble when they shut them down. Now, of course, a counter argument to this is companies could stop selling these games as goods and say they're services. Yes, they can do that, but companies really don't want to for at least two reasons. The first reason is psychological and related to sales. Fine, let's say you buy Anthem 2 or whatever, and now instead of a perpetual license, you get a subscription license and it expires after four years. Well, if they do that, then now everybody knows how long it's going to last, and that might wake customers up and reconsider if they really want to buy a game that's going to die. See, games dying is obvious to me, but it's not to your average consumer. $60 may not seem like such a great price if you've been informed in clear terms that the game could end after four years. Right now, game companies will kill games as a service anytime they feel like it. But they want you to think that the game will last forever, the way most games in the past did. Customers have been conditioned for decades to expect their games to last. So companies want to take advantage of that mentality. If they're forced to be honest when the games could expire, that will depress sales. Now the second reason is if the opposite happens. Say the game is a complete bomb and sales are terrible. Well then the company doesn't want the legal responsibilities of providing service for four years since that's money out of their pocket. They want to be able to cut and run as soon as the game becomes unprofitable. Well that's easy if you're selling goods, not if you're providing a long-term service. Now, with all that said, this used game issue is so huge, companies may decide the disadvantages of being forced to take responsibility for an actual service may be less of a hit financially than allowing used games. Either way, I don't necessarily see this leading to an explosion of games as a service any more than there has been already. I mean, how many commentary videos can you find talking about the market being saturated by games as a service right now? before this law even has any impact. A lot, that's how many. Now I have heard how there could be legal trickery to make something technically a service, but is still indefinite and can be ended at any time. 
Maybe? I have no idea. We need French legal experts for that. Same goes for how free-to-play games enter into all this. I have my opinion in my video, but that's a hazier area for the courts. To be clear, this is not the law I wanted and was not what I was advocating for. I'm a fan of everybody wins, or at least maximum number of people win solutions. If it was me, I would have allowed an exemption for resale requirements of digital games in order to have the revenue foster more growth for creative works, but also require a reasonable chance for the average person to continue playing their game or provide realistic repair instructions so buyers could get their game working again after support from the company ends. So, you know, not make things terrible for business and not make things terrible for consumers. But who would want that? Now, it's possible my seeking a reasonable solution is fantasy. And the only way of forcing companies to stop destroying games was through this combo package of complete ownership, which includes reselling games. If that's the case, then I guess there's no way around it. It's unfortunate because on one side you have the law being rigid and I would argue outdated and in this case it really is creating substantial new problems for gaming in general. But on the other side, let's not forget who brought us here. This court decision didn't come out of a vacuum. The games industry has been so hellbent on removing ownership of your games in the past decade or so that it looks like it's becoming a crisis for a lot of people, not just those concerned about game destruction like myself. Who knows, if the industry had actually respected other ownership rights, like being able to keep your damn game, it might not have led to so much resentment to lead to what I think is a misguided action like this. I mentioned in the fraud video that I wanted just the bare minimum of responsibility from game companies to not destroy games and presented multiple ways of doing that, some with the lightest touch possible. You know, so everybody wins. But of course, not only will the games industry never consider that without force, they generally refuse to recognize consumer rights on much of anything, and wish to take more and more away. So now we have the government intervening in the sloppiest way possible, dropping a nuclear bomb of requirements that doesn't really fix the problem. Ironically, I don't even think Valve is the real problem here. I mean, they're sure as hell not part of the solution, but I see them more as an enabler towards the loss of ownership rather than the actual culprit. Now, I did see a few comments talking about how this is all proof of how the government ruins everything. But I think those people aren't seeing the forest for the trees. If we step back and look at it, the government surprisingly behaved exactly as intended. The consumer group sought to enforce laws regarding resale of software, and that's exactly what happened. I saw people talking about how all these bad changes to developers in the industry are unintended consequences. Yeah, I guess, but they sure as hell were an unforeseeable consequences. I mean, I was able to see the problems this could cause within minutes of hearing this news. I'm really curious as to what was the motivation that led that consumer group pushing for these changes. I mean, is this really what they wanted? Or were they clueless and just had no idea of the negative consequences this was going to lead to? If I had to guess, I think this was probably an emotional reaction to seeing ownership rights being taken away in general for games. So you could blame this on government if you want, but really what happened was a consumer group was asking for a very problematic change, and they got it. In programming, there's a term for this called garbage in, garbage out. If you have a bad program, you don't necessarily blame the computer. This is also why in my fraud video, I was only focusing on not destroying games and kept my scope limited just to that. Saving games requires so much less of the industry than this French law here. Remember how Australia forced Valve to require refunds and they complied and that did not end the games industry as we know it? What I'm seeking arguably has an even lower economic impact than that. Laws can be good or bad. It all depends on what they are. So what now? Well, since this law is here and it's damn similar to what I need, I may as well use it. 
My plan now is to try and write up a call for action to the French consumer group that started all this and get a French translator and see where we can take this. Now, some of you may be saying, what? Ross, are you crazy? This is the group that got this terrible law passed. Why would you want anything to do with them? Well, even though I think that this particular case was a bad move on their part, they were representing the consumer, and more importantly, they demonstrated that French consumer laws have teeth, and they can get something done. Like it or not, we still need the law if we're going to stop games from being destroyed. Because the industry is doing everything it can to ensure more and more are. There is no non-government market solution to this problem. The market wants to destroy as many games as is profitable. That's not cool with me. So that's my rough plan right now. If you want to help though, by all means, contact me. Believe it or not, I'm pretty busy with my own stuff to be saving games also, but it's got to be done. It's like I said in the fraud video. I'm best as a mascot to rally around while other people help out too. It's not like I'm the chosen one here, but in the absence of that, yeah, I'll keep at this and do my best. But my best probably isn't as good as some of your best on this issue. Although, you know what? It probably will be better than whoever pushed the consumer group to demand digital use games. I'm at least thinking about what I'm doing. I'm not sure they did that. If you follow my fraud video and have a grasp on this, hell, you could write up the draft letter. We could make it from all of us. If you know something about planned obsolescence or right to repair laws for goods in the European Union, that can make it easier for us to present our case to the group. Or hey, maybe we should set up a petition to show the consumer group that there is real interest in using French law to stop companies from destroying games. Or maybe you want to be the one to organize all this and just use me as a megaphone. That works too. If you think you can help on this, contact me. Let's plan this out. I feel like we're actually getting closer. Okay, that's it for Dead Game News. This is probably the most positive one so far, even though this is still a complete mess. See you later.